So Red Dead Redemption 2, the controversy continues. Now here on Digital Foundry we've already covered the GPU side extensively, talking about what you need to hit 1080p at 60 frames per second. And to be honest, while there are some issues in performance, most notably on Nvidia cards that aren't Turing based in nature, well you can get some pretty good results. Specifically an AMD Radeon RX 580 is good for better than console visuals at 1080p 60. But the fact is that a lot of people are still having issues with the game and their own personal quests for 60 frames per second action. So I decided to return to the game and do a little more digging. I think I've got a pretty decent handle on what the game needs graphically, so the next variable to consider is the CPU. So yeah, we're going to be taking a look at that, and I think it's fair to say that while you don't need expensive hardware to get a great experience, the traditional norms, the traditional expectations of CPU performance for a AAA game are upended somewhat. So it is somewhat like graphics in that regard, and to be clear I still think there's some unfinished business there. I've put together a GPU power ladder ranking all of the major GPUs currently on the market. And there, again, expectations are somewhat skewed compared to the reality of Red Dead 2 performance. And I think there is some explanation required there, and I'll be trying to do just that. But let's talk about the CPU first. I went in all guns blazing with an overclocked i7 8700K there during my initial testing. And let's be totally clear, this CPU provides an absolute ton of overhead. I pointed out in my first video that experiments with a Ryzen 3 2200G looked a bit weird, but summarised that Ryzen and Core i5 and indeed possibly a faster Core i3 could do the job. Ok, so let's jump straight into some performance testing. I'm using Alex's optimised settings here. Console quality with additional bling on top where the PC better suits the feature, like an isotropic filtering for example, or running on low, medium or high on specific presets that may be of a hybrid nature on Xbox One X. To begin with, this is the Sandini scripted benchmark. I'm running my 8700K at stock clocks here with 2666 MHz RAM. 4.3 GHz all core turbo then, and some overhead left on the table in terms of memory bandwidth. Compared to that, I have an i5 8400, 6 cores at 3.8 GHz, and a Ryzen 5 2600, 6 cores, 12 threads at around 3.7. All CPUs are tested at 1080p resolution with a 2080 Ti, so we are always CPU limited. And with that in mind, don't be afraid of wobbly frame times here, because that's what happens when you're CPU bound on most games. But large stutters? That's another thing entirely, and I'll get onto that. Ok, so the end result, the i5 can dip beneath 70 frames per second, but by and large it's faster than the 2600 across the bench. If we average out all of the highest frame times in the sequence and translate into frame rate, when looking at the lowest 1%, 81 FPS on the 8700K with a 118 FPS average, i5 109 FPS, 2600 99 FPS. However, the lowest 1% results on the mainstream chips are fascinating. The Ryzen 5 2600 records a 67 frames per second average versus 57 on the i5. The 2600 then, it's slower but it's more consistent, and this is really important. Bottom line though, if you're gunning for 60 frames per second and you have a frame rate limiter in place, 6 core chips from both AMD and Nvidia look good. But is the Sandini Benchmark indicative of actual gameplay. I'd say that it's great for testing relative performance with equal workloads, that's for sure. Actual gameplay though, it's more dynamic, so there will be more variances in like for like testing, something else the benchmark eliminates. But looking at manual runs through the city here, the 8700K rules as you would expect, but keep an eye on the red and green lines. Red, AMD with the 2600, is more consistent than green, which wavers a lot more often. Also interesting is that while the bench gives the 8400 a pretty big win in terms of average frame rate, the 2600 is faster in actual gameplay I'd say, wouldn't you? So Core i5 8th or 9th gen, Ryzen 5 6 cores 12 threads, I think that's the baseline here for gunning for 60 frames per second in RDR2. And this leads us on into more 
dangerous territory. The i5-8400 already looks a touch wobbly with frame rate unlocked, and my tests seem to indicate that if you have a quad-core chip, particularly Core i5 from 7th gen or lower, well, getting consistent performance will be a lot more challenging. Let's return to the benchmark then with three quad-core contenders. i7, 7700K at stock clocks. Four cores, eight threads at 4.2 gigahertz, and I've stacked that up against the 7600K without hyper-threading at the same 4.2 gigahertz. And rounding off the head-to-head -to, -head, um, to head, there's the Core i5-6600, which seems to top out at about 3.6. All are effectively based on the same Skylake core. So we're looking at hyper-threading versus hyper-threading off on the left-hand side there. Then we're looking at four cores, four threads at 4.2 and 3.6 gigahertz respectively on the right. So basically a frequency face-off there. Average frame rates at 105, 84 and 75 FPS respectively. A 25% boost to overall performance with hyper-threading enabled, while an extra 600 megahertz gifts the 7th gen core a 12% lead over 6th gen. Consistency though, grouping together lowest 1% results though, the 7700K hits 59 FPS versus the 48 FPS and 37 FPS of its quad core comrades, meaning that the averages are kind of useless here in terms of judging an actual gameplay experience. All of these processors deliver a bumpier ride than the Ryzen 5 2600, even the 7700K. The 6600 suffers particularly here with a big frame time stutter in the benchmark, which we've established gives the CPU an easier ride than the same actual location in gameplay. So let's take a look at gameplay and you can see some weird results. Just running across the open world gives us some lurching frame rate dips on the 7700K something we never saw in prior tests uh, with the 8400 and Ryzen 5 2600, both of which are traditionally slower gaming CPUs. Stutters seem random in nature. Here's the 7600K suffering while the slower 6600 is doing all right. And this is why benchmarking is so difficult on the CPU side. You never really know what's going on behind the scenes and what is causing the bottlenecks. GPU benching is so much more predictable by comparison. Summing up though, only the 7700K keeps you north of 60 frames per second, but even then, there are worrying signs that Red Dead 2 doesn't really like quad-core processors. Remember that the consoles give developers access to six and a half cores worth of CPU resources on their octa-core Jaguar setups, and those games are running at 30 FPS. Some engines are simply designed to be optimal at 30 Hz, meaning that breaking the barrier there requires much more CPU power than you might expect. But this doesn't necessarily mean that a PC port is suboptimal. So our final test stacks up the 6-core Ryzen 5 2600 we've already seen with the freshly minted Ryzen 5 3400G, a quad-core APU that runs with a 4 GHz all-core turbo. RDR2 likes threads and the 3400G beats the i5-6600 and is only a touch slower than the 7600, with similar lowest 1% scores in the 46 to 48 FPS territory. 2600, based on the same Zen Plus architecture, is miles ahead in both overall performance and consistency. And if we look at that 3400G, turning off hyper-threading or SMT delivers a 64 FPS average in the benchmarks, but a poor 36 FPS on the lowest 1%. And again, hyper-threading on the AMD side gives us a 26% boost in gameplay. Results are skewed lower to the point where the 3400G without SMT is actually beneath the 40 FPS threshold I set on the frame rate grid for most of the duration. Even with SMT and with a 4 GHz clock, a quad-core Ryzen just doesn't cut it. I wanted to put the 2600 in here simply to demonstrate that you don't need the absolute latest and greatest to get great Red Dead 2 results, but the fact is that Rockstar's Rage engine in its latest iteration is tuned for many core processors. Before I move on though, one more thing. I am using Alex's optimized settings here. Console quality with additional embellishments but still running a gamut of mostly high, medium and low settings with a smattering of ultra. Increasing fidelity by pushing out draw distances is likely to increase CPU load still further, but the end result will kind of be the same overall. Red Dead 2's makeup 
subverts traditional expectations from the CPU power ladder. There's no doubt about it, the 7700K smokes first and second gen Ryzen 7 and Ryzen 5, but here it's delivering a quantifiably worse experience, no doubt about it. And I just can't recommend playing the game on a 4-core, four 4-thread four processor. We've seen what running a 2200G with a 1660 can do and it's not pretty. The same thing happened with a 3400G with SMT disabled, which isn't really surprising. And yeah, you can encounter gargantuan frame time stutter here. What you're seeing here is the first base camp, and the 3400G with four threads active has a massive 8.5 second stutter and 8,500 millisecond frame time. So yeah, six cores, that should be the baseline. Let's move on now to the subversion of the GPU power ladder I talked about. So check this out, I benched the game at Alex's console plus settings at 2160p resolution on everything from an RTX 2080 Ti to GTX 1060. And I don't really go lower at this resolution to be honest. CPU wise I'm back on my overclocked 8700K here, so no worries there. The table here stacks up Red Dead 2's GPU rankings against a 9 game average from elsewhere in our benchmarks and there are some fascinating results. At the top end, RTX 2080 Ti and RTX 2080 Super retain their traditional leads at the top of the table. However, Radeon 7 propels itself ahead of the 2070 Super with an overall 8% lead. GTX 1080 Ti, which is usually a touch faster than Radeon 7, well that actually drops down to number 6 on the table behind uh, the Navi powered RX 5700 XT. If you look across the table, a trend starts to emerge. Radeon GPU hardware punches above its weight, bringing it into closer contention with Nvidia's Turing cards. I mean, check this out, Vega 56 actually delivers the same average frame rate as the 2060 Super, with a 4% boost to the lowest 1% metric. This is very definitely against the run of play when you look at our uh, 9 game average. And while AMD is trending above its usual performance, knocking on Turing's door in many cases, Pascal is having genuine issues here. Seeing the 5700 XT beat the 1080 Ti by 8% is just the beginning. Vega 56 beats the 1080 by 13%, a trick it only usually pulls off against GTX 1070. Meanwhile, the 1070 is beaten by RX 590. Now this is at 4K, this is at circa Xbox One X quality settings. But however you bench Red Dead 2, the same results generally tend to pop up. AMD has more performance than its average. Turing is great at the lower end, but loses some momentum as we move down the power ladder, while Pascal is way, way off pace. But returning to the question of the most outrageously poor performance you're likely to encounter, well, that's definitely from the CPU side, from what I can see. This is one of the most advanced multi-platform game engines of the generation, and if it hasn't been illustrated already by the likes of Assassin's Creed Odyssey, the days of the quad-core processor as a great gaming CPU are slowly coming to an end. Four cores and eight threads combined with a high clock can hang on for now. But for how much longer, I do wonder. Remember that next-gen consoles are going to ship with eight cores and 16 threads. So yeah, I think that these uh, results that sort of subvert the norm. This is just the beginning. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed this video and perhaps gained some clarity here. Red Dead Redemption 2 uh, definitely goes against typical expectations from a PC port, but if my prior video and Alex's settings guide hasn't illustrated that already, well hopefully this will. But that's all from me for now. As always, please do like and subscribe to support our work and ring the bell for instant notifications whenever a new Digital Foundry video arrives on the channel. And yeah, if you like what we do and want to support the team more directly, I urge you to consider the DF Patreon. Your support, your direct support for the team makes in-depth work along the lines of our Red Dead efforts actually viable from a financial perspective. And of course, you get high quality video downloads into the bargain. And that's where I'm going to be leaving things for now. Thanks for making it all the way to the end of this one and just generally thanks from me and the Digital Foundry team for your continued support.